Okay, so we're just gonna start the presentation off. Uh, please let me know if you can hear the presentation when it starts and uh, we'll give her a go now. Hello, and welcome to our presentation on genomic technology. So first, a little bit about who we are. Hi, my name is Jackie, and I'm a fourth year animal health student at the University of Alberta. I was born and raised in Edmonton, Alberta, and I've been working directly with livestock for the past four years through the university. After working with chickens, pigs, and alpacas, I decided cows were more my speed and have since been focusing on dairy cows and beef cattle. Last summer, I lived out at Roybird Kinsella Research Ranch studying beef cattle seen in the picture below. From left to right, these were our cows Gladys, Betty, and Harriet. We had a fourth cow named Karen, but when she decided to try to kill us, we decided to let her go to pasture. Working with Livestock Gentag as a part of this project for the past few months has been a really rewarding experience which is why I'm excited to continue working with Livestock Gentech this summer in hopes of ultimately improving the Alberta beef industry using the genomic technologies we'll be discussing today. Hello everyone, I'm Diego. I'm originally from Ecuador in South America where my grandparents and parents had some dairy and beef cattle. I moved to BC when I was eight and I've been in Edmonton since 2018. I'm in my fourth year of animal science at the University of Alberta and I have experience working with both dairy and beef cattle. My main interests in university are genetics, nutrition, and the economics behind animal production. This summer, I'll have the opportunity to work with Livestock Gentech, which I'm very excited for. Now, what makes a good calf? When you picked out your calf in 4-H, what did you look for? How did you pick it out just by looking at it? The first step for us is confirmation. That is, the important physical characteristics that may determine the future value of your animal. When looking at beef cattle in general, we want to see good feet. This means a normal hoof shape, normal ankles and legs, so we can avoid feet issues in the future, along with good hoof growth rate. For frame size, we want a large frame for our steer so they can fill up with that muscle and meat, but we also don't want huge animals that will cause our cows issues when calving. Specifically for heifers and cows, I mainly think about udders. It is important that for heifers to have good udders as they're going to feed our calves for the first six months of their life when nutrition is key. We want good teeth that are facing straight down, not angled, and strong suspensory ligaments that will support the udder as the cow grows. The second criteria that we look at is efficiency. In your 4-H record books, you calculate average daily gain, which is how fast your animal is growing, and feed conversion ratio, which is a measure of efficiency. FCR, or feed conversion ratio, is just how much feed it takes for a certain amount of weight gain. We want your calf to gain more using less feed. Feed is a high expense in production, so reducing feed may increase your revenue. It is also very hard to predict when selecting your calf, as you have not much information on their performance. So what does it mean to be efficient in the context of a beef animal? It means we use less feed to gain weight. For example, if we have two animals that both are gaining two pounds a day, but one is eating less, we would say that the one that is eating less is more efficient than the other one. We also want less nutrients wasted and excreted as manure and gases like methane. The less waste there is, the more nutrients are being used up by the animal for maintenance of its body and for growth. Here is where we run into some issues. Average daily gain and feed conversion ratios are two traits that are related. So selecting for an improved feed conversion ratio, which is efficiency, may affect average daily gain, which is our weight gain. So what is the solution? Well, one solution is to use a trait that is independent from other growth traits like average daily gain. We use a trait called residual feed intake. Residual feed intake, or RFI, is just a subtraction. It is the predicted intake minus the actual intake, and that leftover value is the residual feed intake. Now, to calculate the predicted intake, it requires a whole bunch of fancy math that the people at Lifestyle Agenda can do for us, while the actual intake is recorded on site when your animal is eating. Another characteristic that we would like to know that would make a calf good is its carcass quality, which includes marbling of meat, fat content around the meat, and the meat yield or how much meat we get from that specific animal. We mentioned marbling previously, but what is it? Well, it's the intramuscular fat in a cut of meat. As you can see in the image, a more marbled steak will have those white flecks in the meat, while a less marbled fleck would have less white flecks. More marb marbling is desired as it is an indicator of higher quality. Marbling in steaks is determined before the calf is even born, so how does that make sense at all? Well, when a calf is in its mom's uterus, the cells are already in place, 
So that means there's only a certain amount that, that it can grow in its life. So how do we know which calf will have more fat cells in the muscle earlier? Fat in the carcass mainly refers to extramuscular fat, which is a fat that surrounds muscles, bones, and connective tissues. This type of fat is deposited in the finishing stages of an animal's life, usually in a feedlot. More back fat is a desirable characteristic in carcass. Finally, when talking about carcass quality, we have yield, and that is how much meat we get from a carcass. As you can imagine, carcass yield is a very important trait for us to look at. We have two important yield traits. It is hard carcass weight and lean meat yield. Hard carcass weight is just the weight of the animal without uh, its head or any skin, while lean meat yield is the amount of lean meat from the total hot carcass weight. Another trait that makes a calf great is feed intake. We talk about dry matter intake, dry matter being the amount of food they eat that does not contain water. Generally, DMI is related to weight gain, so a higher feed intake will result in a higher weight gain. This doesn't always hold true. An efficient animal will consume less feed and still gain the same amount as an animal that consumes a lot of feed and has the same weight gain. Let's explore genomics a little bit, what it actually is, and what this technology can do for your herd. Thinking about all the traits that Diego just explained, particularly feed efficiency and carcass characteristics, these can be hard to predict at the time that you select your calf. This is where genomics comes in. Genomics allows us to predict the performance of these traits to help you make more informed decisions. But what exactly is genomics? Well, first we need to establish what DNA is. Think of DNA and genes as the instructions in each of the cells of your body that make you, you. Do you have brown hair or are you blonde? Are you tall or short? These are things that are determined by your DNA. In the same way, DNA controls the traits that Diego just explained in cows. Conformation, feed efficiency, and carcass quality. Genomics is a science that analyzes the DNA and genes of an animal. Genomics allows us to read the DNA, and through some math and a little bit of science, we can predict an animal's performance and even the performance of its offspring. So what are the advantages of genomics? Well, genomics is especially useful for traits like feed efficiency that can be difficult or expensive to measure. This technology can also predict traits that could only be measured by sacrificing a potential breeding candidate, like carcass merit traits. Another advantage is that you could learn your animal's genetic merit as soon as their DNA is analyzed. In other words, genomics could predict how much meat your calf will eventually yield as soon as it's born. Are you looking to reach your herd objectives faster? Genomic tools can increase the rate of genetic improvement for multiple traits at the same time. Highly relevant traits related to feeder calf profitability such as growth, feed intake, feed efficiency, and carcass merit can be improved quicker by more accurately selecting superior sires and calves. And one final advantage is that genomics can be tailored to fit the needs of any individual producer. Whether you're looking to increase AAA cutout yields, improve post-weaning average daily gain, or increase carcass marbling, each of these goals can be targeted and achieved with genomics. We will go into a few examples of how and what traits you would select to achieve a specific goal later in the presentation. We talked about some traits in our calf section, but now we're going to go into some more detail in terms of selection for these traits. First, we have what we call AFAT. This is the average back fat thickness, which is measured at site number three. Having too little back fat has a negative effect on meat quality and can lead to carcass grading dockages. All carcasses that have less than two millimeters of back fat automatically grade B1, so you want to have greater than that. A large excess of back fat increases the cost of trimming. We kind of want to be in between 2 and 8 millimeters of back fat, so it's important to think about this trait when selecting animals. Hot carcass weight, as mentioned previously, is the weight of the carcass after the head, hide, and internal organs are removed. Dressing percentage is the proportion of hot carcass weight to body weight, and that is an important feature when grading carcasses. A higher hot carcass weight will result in more beef cuts and steaks, which means more money for us. Ribeye area is the area of the ribeye cut. It might seem self-explanatory, but is an important measure of carcass yield and as such can be selected for using genomic tools. Ideally, we want a larger ribeye area since ribeye is a prime cut of beef that will result in more money in our pockets. Marbling in meat refers to the intramuscular fat content, as I mentioned. 
and marbling is very desirable and is only considered when grading A meat or higher. Grading A or higher increases the returns of producers, so maximizing carcass marbling is key. As I mentioned earlier, carcass marbling is determined early on in the animal's life stages. We mentioned that there's only a certain amount of fat cells within the muscle, and so using genomic tools, we are able to predict which animals at a young age have a higher amount of fat cells in the muscle compared to others, and that way we can select for animals that may have higher marbling, which will result in higher grades, and then at the end of the line, that results in a higher profit for producers. Lean meat yield is a proportion of the carcass that is solely lean meat. Lean meat, if you don't know, is considered the muscle in an animal plus the water content inside those muscle cells. It excludes bone and fat. Lean meat yield should be considered alongside average back fat and carcass marbling, not alone. Those three traits comprise of our kind of our carcass evaluation traits. According to a research project performed by the Beef Cattle Research Council, quality beef can be classified as above average lean meat yield and marbling. Lean beef is classified as above average lean meat yield and below average marbling, and marble beef can be classified as average or below average lean meat yield and above average marbling. Now how can these results be used in your herd? After doing some genomic testing, you may receive a sheet like this. We have an index at the top, a genomically retained heterozygosity value in the middle, which we will explain. And then we have this nice big chart of genomically predicted EPDs or estimated progeny differences. Down at the bottom left, we have a genomic breed composition chart. And on the right, we have some definitions of the traits that we have looked over already. At this point, you guys should be experts at these traits. I'm kidding, but at the same time, we want to know what it means to select for these traits. So we have included a definition on the right. We want to interpret these results to be uh, to be able to make selection decisions in for the animal and for the herd. So if we look at this genomically predicted EPD chart, we have a line down the middle that has the zero. The zero means average. So if your animal has a zero, it doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean it's great or awesome. It means it's average. It performs the same as most of the animals in the herd. If the line is above zero, it means that that, that trait is above average and less than zero means it's below average for that trait. Now, there are some traits that we want to have a number greater than zero and a number less than zero. For example, average daily gain, is that which is the growth trait, we want higher numbers because we want animals to grow faster so we can get them to market sooner and get our money quicker. While residual feed intake, which measures feed efficiency, we want a lower value. A lower value indicates a more efficient animal. Negative is ideal for selecting an efficient sire or a dam. We also have our carcass qualities here on the right. In general, we want these carcass qualities to be higher. We want more marbling in our steaks. We want a larger ribeye area. We want a lot of meat from our carcass and we want our hot carcass weight to be heavy. All right, so you've received your genomic results from livestock gen text, and now you know how to interpret them. But how can these results be used in your herd? The first step is to set your goals, and the second step is to choose a sire or a dam with the GEPDs that will accomplish these goals. Maybe your goal is to improve feed efficiency. Then you would choose animals with low residual feed intake. Looking to increase weight gain? Choose animals with high average daily gain. Do you want to improve carcass quality? Select animals that have high heart carcass weight, lean meat yield, and ribeye area. It is important to keep in mind other traits when moving towards a specific goal. For example, say you are looking to improve average daily gain. A common mistake might be to look for a sire with the best average daily gain and breed him to 20 cows. Unfortunately, that same animal might have a low lean meat yield, and your resulting offspring may have a really great average daily gain, but it was at the detriment of lean meat yield. So maybe one of your goals is to improve overall herd productivity and health. To achieve this, you would choose animals with average GEPDs across all traits using an index like the feeder profit index, which we'll delve into later. Another option for using your results in your herd is to manage breeding and heterozygosity. Hybrid vigor, or heterozygosity, is a fancy word that means a crossbred offspring will outperform its parents for a desired characteristic. These scores range from 0 to 1, and a higher score is always better. 
For instance, if you were to cross animal A, a mostly Simmental animal, with animal B, a 50-50 mix of Simmental and Black Angus, we would expect that the calf will perform better over its life compared to parent A, since it will have a higher heterozygosity score. Alternatively, if you were to use animal A for breeding, you might want it to breed it to a Black Angus or a breed other than Simmental to increase hybrid vigor further. If you did this and bred animal A to a bovine that was largely Black Angus, the calf's breed composition will look more like animal B, and you'll notice that heterozygosity increased from 0.32 in the dam to 0.52 in her calf. Heterozygosity can also be used for complement traits. If one parent was lacking in a trait, you could breed it to an animal that was good for that trait. For example, breed a dam that had poor marbling to a sire with good marbling to produce a calf with improved marbling. In summary, hybrid vigor leads to better overall fitness. You may have heard me earlier mention a selection index in that picture of all the graphs and charts. Now, a multiple selection index is a value that combines many traits along with economic weights for each trait. A selection index allows us to select for sires and dams with high economic values. A selection index can focus on reproductive traits or growth traits. The advantage of using a selection index is that we can combine multiple traits for and and get uh and get one value and using this value we can compare multiple animals at the same time. This means that an animal with a high index value compared to another means that it's better in that certain area of performance. For example, if we want a growth trait index, we would include things such as average daily gain dry matter intake, and other carcass characteristics, or we can even include something that's not in the sheet like our weaning weight or birth weight. Using that index and grading and putting all our animals information and genomic information into the index, we can get some numbers that will show us which animals have a better index value. And the animals that have a better index value are more likely to perform better than the ones with lower values uh, in terms of growth characteristics. From a reproductive trait point of view, we're looking at uh, calving ease uh, primarily, and that kind of shows um, the multiple uh, ways to use a selection index. Life's objective has developed the feeder profit index, which combines economic values of feeding and carcass traits, along with predicted progeny performances performances, so the GEPDs, which is that yellow chart we saw earlier, of these traits. On the right, we see a little table that shows the traits included in the FPI with uh, post wean average daily gain, feed intake, metabolic midweight, which is the metabolic weight of the animal at the midpoint of its life, residual feed intake, and carcass merit, with the emphasis of each graded from uh, 1 to 5. The genomic part and the economic part of an animal's predicted performance is combined to produce a fodder profitability index. When you receive your genomic results, you'll find a single value for the feeder profit index. What does it indicate? Well, it indicates the profitability of these beef cattle. The point of this selection index is to make things a little more simple by giving you one value to look at rather than five or six. Its interpretation is pretty simple too. A higher FPI, the more money we earn from them. Let's go through a couple of real-life examples to demonstrate the relationship between your FPI number and economic profitability. So on the left, you'll see a fact sheet with an FPI of negative 185.23. On the right, you'll see one with an FPI of 896.59. Based on the data from over 27,000 beef cattle collected since 2010, every 100 point change in FPI results in an increased net profit of $29 per feeder. It has also been determined that an average FPI, or FPI of zero, predicts a net gain of $151. This means that our sire on the left will yield a net profit of 97.28 per feeder, and the sire on the right, 411. You'll notice that even the sire on the left, who is below average, will still generate a net profit using genomics. Now, if each of these bulls were to sire 10 calves every year, an average bull would create $1,510 in profit per year. Our bull on the left would still yield a net gain of $973 per year, and our bull on the right would yield just over $4,100 per year. 
And what was the initial cost to the producer? Only $45 to get that initial bull genotyped. How to maximize the benefits of the FPI index? It really depends on your goals. If you're wanting to improve a single aspect of the herd, focus on selecting one trait. The drawback of this is that some other traits may suffer as a result. Using an economically weighted multiple trait index like the FPI allows for maximizing profit without compromising one or more aspects of the herd. Why do we use it? First, we want to select the superior sires or cows with higher FPI in our herds. The higher the FPI, the faster we develop our herds with superior cattle, which means increased feed efficiency, growth, and carcass value. Higher feed efficiency means higher growth, and higher growth in desirable carcass characteristics increases carcass value. By maximizing the carcass value, we can maximize the profit we generate at finishing and slaughter. So now I'm going to talk about combining genomics with phenotypes. Now phenotype is just the expression of a genotype, which is your genes, your DNA, plus the environment that animal is in. We could also refer to phenotype as performance. So the performance of an animal is uh, influenced by the environment it's in, plus the genomic value or the DNA in, in the instructions in its DNA. Now genomics is not free, so how do we maximize what we can get out of it? We want to add genomics with visual assessments of animals. You know, if you're looking at your calf and it doesn't seem to have good feet, or it, doesn't, it seems to have poor weight gain, or it's not eating as much, or it has a disease susceptibility, or your heifer uh, has calving issues, or milk fever issues, um, then you might not even bother testing that animal because it will have it might not have a high enough genetic merit and it just might not be uh, economical to improve that animal's performance using genomics so the, as a as a producer we want to not only use genomics but we want to combine the information we get from genomics with the information that we're seeing not only with our eyes but recording with weights with, in recording with weights, uh, feed intake, disease susceptibility, that sort of thing. So as I mentioned, we want to increase the recording of phenotypes. We want to keep cattle weights, we want to test for back fat, and we want the carcass grading information we get from slaughterhouses and abattoirs. More data on these traits improves genomic accuracy over time, which that will overall improve the accuracy of our selections over time. This is a good opportunity to talk about herd tracks. They kind of help us out with the discovery and validation and demonstration of tools and are a good partner to livestock Genk tech. Herd tracks will allow us to uh, kind of track our animal and import information which will only lead to uh, increased accuracies of genomic tools and genomic selection. As I talked about previously, the environment has an effect on the performance of an animal. When selecting for specific traits, we must be aware of the environment animals are in. For example, studies have shown differences in methane emissions and feed efficiency when using low RFI cattle, kind of the same animals, you know, uh, let's say we have 10 heifers that have similar RFI values and, and then 10 heifers with the same amount of values, but we put them in two environments a pasture environment and a dry lot environment or feedlot environment. We saw that there, the research study showed that there are different levels of emissions and different feed efficiencies at different points in t uh, at different environmental points. For example, in a dry lot, you're more likely to have a diet that's high in grain, which means it's higher in, uh, in energy content. So the efficiency is going to be higher compared to a pasture system where the quality might not be as high and the and the cow or the heifers or the steers have to spend more time digesting and ruminating and getting the most out of that fiber. In quantitative traits, so traits with numbers like weight and intake, the environmental effect on performance tends to be higher than non-quantitative or qualitative traits. Now you may be wondering, why am I showing you all this information? Why are we sharing this? How can I use this in my herd? How, what would be the outcome of using genomics? And luckily for us, we have our own very real life example 
at the University of Alberta. Kinsella Ranch, where uh, Jackie has worked previously, is a ranch east of Alberta that has a lot of cattle, beef cattle research for the University of Alberta. Kinsella Ranch has a herd called the Kinsella Composite. It's comprised of a mix of breeds. We have Angus in there, Charolais, Galway, Hereford, Brown Swiss, Holstein, and Semmental. All the heifers in that herd have been genomically tested. Well, we have a ex very special experiment going on there at the moment. The herd was split into a couple of years ago. We have a control herd and an efficient herd based on RFI values, that's residual feed intake. So the efficient herd has only low RFI value heifers. The herds are treated the same in terms of environment and nutrition and only differ in RFI values of replacement heifers and bulls. Now we have some interesting results after a couple of years of information gathering. There's a 0.8% difference every year in RFI between the control and efficient herd. Now that may not sound like a lot, but 0.8 for the past 8%, for, sorry, for the past five years means there is now a divergence between the control herd and the efficient herds in terms of feed efficiency. For example, in 2020, the efficient heifers consumed 4.8 less per, sorry, 4.8 less feed than control heifers. In feed costs, that turns out to be a $23 per heifer per year savings compared to the control herd. At the same time, we also have real data showing reduced methane emissions from efficient herd compared to the control herd. We do have some considerations with, in reference to using genomic selection for RFI. For Kinsella Ranch, it took around five years to replace all cows with the efficient heifers, which are now the efficient cows. There's also no research on limits or the effects of long-term RFI selection. Results can vary on the selection intensity and accuracy. Intensity just refers to the proportion of animals that are selected to produce the next generation of animals. For example, Kinsella Herd used a, to a top 25% selection intensity. If you increase the selection intensity to, the to maybe the top 12% or top 10%, you will have greater gains er over the years but it would also take longer to replace all cows in the in the herd. Now we have some future possibilities with genomics. We have there are currently a lot of challenges facing agriculture and in the next 10 years will face some that are more important than others. For example, we are seeing less land available with the transformation and conversion of agricultural land to urban land. With genomics, we can use this as a solution by selecting animals with higher feed efficiency that will use less land and we can produce the same amount of meat. At the same time, population is projected to grow to 9 billion by 2050. That means we just have more people to feed, not only in Canada, but to other countries that Canada exports to, like Australia, the US, Mexico, and Asia, and Europe. With faster growing cattle by selecting for dry matter intake and average daily gain, we can have we can feed more people with the same amount of animals or less. Finally, there is an environmental concern. As you are aware, there is uh, a changing global climate at the moment, and we want to not we don't as a beef industry we would like not only to lessen our carbon footprint but also become sustainable in the long term. Selection for efficiency reduces methane emissions in cattle. That means selecting for RFI. RFI at the moment is the hot topping and we want to address that issue of the sustainability of beef by selecting for more efficient animals. We want to thank you for having us today. We really appreciate the opportunity of talking to you. And if you have any questions about anything, we're happy to take them at this moment. Thank you again. All right. Um... Thanks for listening, everyone. Uh, we're happy to take any questions you may have. I know that was a lot to, to process. So um, if you just want to go back to a slide, even we can explain a slide more thoroughly if you'd like. Um, but yeah, um, we're, we're open. So you have one in the chat. How much does the testing cost to get done? 
Uh, so usually it costs about $45 per, per animal when we're doing it through Neogen. Uh, for the 4-H project, this was discounted to $15 per animal um, just uh, because we got some funding from uh, Alberta. Um, I think it was an Alberta uh, uh, environmental organization that donated some money for us to get it tested for lower. So yeah, per animal, it's usually $45 in a commercial setting. How do we market the carcass and the gun? I'm just looking through the chat if we have any more. Yeah, sorry about the volume, guys. <laughs> it was also pretty low on my computer. <laughs> would, you, would the question, how do we market the carcass in the competition? Like, what exactly are you looking for? Can you just explain that a little bit more? Uh, yeah, so marketing carcasses, I'm not sure what you're referring to there. Uh, if I get from the question, how do we market the carcass? Uh, well, in terms of from the information we gave uh, in this presentation, we want to uh, increase uh, just marbling in the carcass in general. Um, marbling is kind of, if we look at how Canada, Agriculture Canada grades carcasses, uh, at the very bottom, we have a marbling, and that's the last decision. So we want to start off with um, good fat yield. We want to have good uh, muscling, so that's lean meat yield. We want um, a good amount of fat, so greater than two millimeters, so it can be considered uh, into the next step. And then we flow into uh, muscling. Then we flow into fat color, which is not really relevant to genetics. Uh, that is kind of just relevant to nutrition, but it's still part of the carcass grading. Uh, there's also color of meat, which is again, uh, in terms of nutrition. And finally, we have marbling. So marketing question just for the program, what happens to the actual carcasses when do you deliver to the provincial competition? So I'm actually not sure about that. Um, if anyone from Forage wants to answer that question. I did just put it in the chat, but the carcass is the 4-H members. Okay. Um, so after it's like delivered and graded and stuff it's still their carcass and they can sell it or um you can eat it whatever okay so i have another question here for uh, from jay in the Kinsella composite herd what are the differences in feedlot performance and carcass merit between the high rfi herd and control herd that's an excellent question um uh in that case uh we do see um less in terms of performance we see less feed intake in the rfi animals and lower methane um, emissions in terms of performance they per, they perform very similarly um very similarly in terms of average weaning weight uh fertility uh and growth so there's not really a big difference in terms of uh of weight gain and weight performance and that is kind of why we like rfi uh, RFI, as I mentioned previously, isn't um, correlated or is not related to weight gain. So even though you're selecting for a, a more efficient animal that consumes less feed, they're using more of that feed to uh, more of that those nutrients in the feed to gain weight and to and to have uh, and deposit fat and muscle uh, tissue. So there's not really a big effect on uh, on weight gain or composition. It's just really about how much feed they're consuming and uh, how much of that feed is being used. Uh, to turn it into meat and fat. Um, so we have, can you explain how to interpret the actual percentiles on the graph we received from genomics report? Okay, so this is a percentiles question. Um, so on the graph, we actually don't, in the graph we showed you guys, we didn't have a percentiles ranking, but if you do have a percentiles ranking, that just means uh, out of the entire uh, pooled results, a percentile ranking can range from the first percentile to the 99th, the 99th being uh, the highest and then first being the lowest. So you kind of want to be above average would be the 50th percentile would be your average uh, ranking for a specific trait. And you kind of want to be toward the higher end in terms of performance. Um, that's the that's kind of the difference between percentiles and what we gave you. We gave you EPD values. So it's relative to the average. So you can have positive or negative. Well, a percentile, it's all positive numbers. Uh, it, closer to zero is the lowest, while closer to 100 is higher. 
Uh, I'll just keep going down. Genetics, do any of the carcass traits relate to fertility? Uh, so fertility is actually a very interesting question. It's actually um, a pretty difficult um, thing at the moment for, um, for genomics to, to predict. Uh, fertility is uh, more influenced by the environment than carcass traits. Uh, so if we have carcass traits, so we have a, uh, sorry, higher percentage. Uh, so yeah, sorry, let me just go over that again. Fertility is more influenced by the environment. So if we, so carcass traits will be less uh, influenced by the environment and more by genomics. So it's easier to predict carcass traits and the prediction from that than fertility. But we do have some fertility traits that are being predicted currently in, in commercially. So we have calving ease, um, which is just relates to frame size in the cows, but also birth weight in, in in calves. So we want to have a lower birth weight in calves just to make for the mom to, to calve it's easier. Okay, I have, if I jump I have a slide, Clint. Which slide should I put up? The pie chart, please. The pie chart, you said? Yeah, I sent you an email that had two different uh, charts yeah. on it. One was the pie oh. chart, one was yeah. the bar chart. And in terms of genetically or genomically, when you look at fertility, um, and stability within a herd, what you really want to look at is uh, high, the hybrid vigor score. But if you go to some traits that all you have to have is one single piece of DNA tells you whether an animal is going to be male or whether it's going to be female. So that, that's relatively simple to determine. Does an animal have horns or does it not have horns? That's one single piece of genetic information. When you start to get into fertility and how long an animal stays in a herd by having a calf every year, there is literally hundreds or thousands, tens of thousands of pieces of DNA that all interact with how you feed them, where they live. Uh, do you vaccinate them? Do you supplement them? So it's an extremely complicated trait. And in terms of looking at genetically, which animals are the most fertile or have the best, um, which are the best candidates for replacement heifer, uh, the higher the head retained heterozygosity or hybrid vigor, the bigger the head hybrid vigor score, the better, more fertile the animals tend to be in the longer term. And basically what that mean, means is that if you have a crossbreed herd, you're gonna be optimizing or have the best fertility compared to a herd that is very narrow and uh, probably not better not wade too far, too much further into that. But what this pie chart shows and the arrows going back into the cube is that each breed has its own individual characteristics and advantages. And that by mixing the breeds that come from different genetic space in the cow universe, you will get greater fertility and stability and maternal traits that in and of themselves are extremely hard to measure just based on genetics. It's a combination of genetics, where they live and how you treat them. In the silence, I'll uh, also like to thank another one of our partners that uh, Neogen did all of the genotyping with us on this project. So they've been a partner of ours from the very beginning and uh, very important for us to get the funding uh, information right that uh, it's uh, Agriculture, Agri-Food Canada, Emissions Reductions Alberta, BCRC and or B the Beef Cattle Research Council and Neogen are all partners in this. So we, we get the samples from you we send them to Neogen. Neogen sends back all of the genotyping information. And the reason we're able to offer a lower price for these samples or as part of this program is that the funding agencies, BCRC, Emissions Reduction Alberta, they all put money towards that because by doing so, they're helping create a better, more productive cow herd within Alberta. If there's no more talking, I'll keep going. But uh, if you wanted to uh, try this in your herd or try, wanted to uh, apply these tools or had any questions, you can get a hold of any one of us at Livestock GenTech. That uh, the program is open for replacement heifers uh, as we develop or, and improve the index. That uh, there's been a number of people from 4-H that having been sitting on the various boards or involved in the project have elected to genotype their entire herds at a cost of $15 for the, the high density or the more complicated genotyping. 
Uh, there's also a pooled program where we take a little bit of DNA from every animal, put it into a blender, and then analyze, and we can provide a herd average. And if you genotype all of the bulls, uh, at a minimum, all of the bulls, uh, we will do the pooled DNA analysis for free, again, with the cost being picked up by some of the funding agencies that are doing this because they want to make the Alberta cow herd better and, and more efficient. I'm done now. I think we also have another question here. Is the testing cost expected to go down over the next few years? Um, obviously, um, genomics actually is very, very new in terms of in, when you're talking about scientific technologies. We started seeing this. Uh, I think the, the initial paper that came up with all this information was in 2007. And now it's uh, only 13 years later. So as technologies, uh, DNA analysis technologies improve, um, they're more efficient. We do expect the cost to probably go down so that it's just affordable for the entire herd rather than, as uh, Clint mentioned, uh, uh, just your breeding bulls and your and your best heifers and, and best cows. So definitely the price would go down in the future just with advances in technology, efficiency, and, and doing uh, genomic analysis. And and just from the from the guys at Lifestyle.Gentech doing all that data analysis and and, and predictions. Nobody has any other questions? Do you have the bar graph too, Tracy, that Clint shared? That we he could talk about that maybe. Are there any individual questions on this, or is this just clarification? Yeah, I think someone asked about percentile rankings and and how to um how to actually uh, get information from this or explain how to interpret the percentile rankings on the graph. If you have the highest percentile ranking and you're the runner in a race, you are number one. If you're the 99th percentile of runners, you are the fastest. If you're the first percentile, you are the slowest. So in general, more is better. And if the bar goes off to the right, it's, it's good. You're better than average. The center line is, is average. To the left, you're below average. To the right, you're above average. And the way you would want to use this information is if you are particularly interested in feed efficient cattle, looking at our RFI, you can see that uh, this animal is one of the better ones or is above average for RFI. So it might be something you'd consider a keeper. If uh, posts weaning weight, or I probably should look that up before I get too excited, but the biggest green bar, if that's very important to you, breeding it into your herd, or that's what you want to select for, this animal would be an ideal candidate, but there are no perfect animals. So every, there's a bit of a trade-off. You can't have everything in most cases. So you might be, you might have to take some trade-offs for selecting below average if you were to use this as a breeding bull. And I can't see the uh, the chats right now. If there's more coming in, or so there was a question of a member having an FPI of 977, and he was wondering if that was good. Oh God, I think so. I don't. I don't want to answer that question, but I can get back to you. That that's what I can promise. Yeah, as we mentioned, indexes are, are kind of a relative number. So we would have to kind of look at the whole and at the whole picture and rank them. That would be the most ideal thing to do with an index. Um, in, in school, we're actually learning how to how to actually make those indexes now, which is really interesting. So it really is just a relative scale um, comparing to the to, to all the animals tested and 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 the in the prediction equations you make uh, rely on. On, on a couple of things, including the weights on each trait. So for example, uh, 
a, a feed profitability index could have higher weights on on things like carcass yield and uh, and uh, an average daily gain. So those would be weighted more heavily compared to to things that are not as important, like let's say a pre-winning weight, which can be gained over time through backgrounding or in the feedlot. So it's really just about the weighting of the index along with the, the relative scale. And when comparing two animals for every 100 unit difference between them, positive 100 unit difference, that there's $29 of increased profit per feeder. So it would depend who, which animals you are comparing it to. You, if you're comparing it to something less than 900, yes, it's good. If you're comparing it to something that's 1500 or whatever the, the number for another animal is, it may not be as favorable. Yeah, I think we have some more questions here. Is it correct that you want the RFI to be smaller on the lower scale and average daily gain to be higher? Uh, so in terms of percentile, you want you just want the highest percentile for, for each trait, ideally. Uh, but if we're just looking at um, uh, predictive performances or, or EPDs, um, you want a low EPD value for a residual feed intake. And yes, you would want a higher EPD value for an average daily gain. Um, so our RFI is just, as I mentioned, your, your predicted intake, which is calculated through a, a statistical equation um, and then your actual intake is what is being measured. And then the difference between those two is what we call the residual feed intake. And then you want that to be uh, either as low as possible or negative. So it means your animal is consuming um, less than what is predicted at still gaining at, at, a certain, at a certain level of average daily gain. Um, would a breed that isn't in your data based change your outcomes. Okay, so uh, we, I think Lifestyle Genetic does test a lot of breeds um, and all that breed is actually come, all that all those breeds are actually contained in the DNA and there's specific um, prediction software that reads DNA and, and, can, and can kind of spit out whichever breed your animal actually is. Um, and yes, there is a, a difference between calculating uh, predictive performance between purebred animals and crossbred animals, which is kind of the, the the difficult part of this of this whole thing in beef compared to dairy. But yes, um, if there is a breed that isn't uh, in the index, it would change it the accuracies of the predictions a little bit. So there was two Abbeys that kind of asked the same question. I just want to be sure that it answered both of them because they were asking um, what, what the animals are, are uh, compared to. And Jackie answered that. Yes, I think ja Jackie did answer that in the chat. Um, but yeah, uh, generally when we're doing genomic testing, we're referencing um, the animals to a, a larger reference population. Um, that Gentech has developed over the years of just testing thousands and thousands of animals. And that way um, we can get a population average rather than just a sample average. So instead of testing 30 animals and comparing it to your animal to that, to those 30, we want to compare the, you say your Angus to 14,000 Anguses and then go off that number, which is just more accurate. Well, if there's no more questions for tonight, uh, thanks to Diego and Jackie and Clinton. And um, yeah, um, a couple had asked about, you know, slaughter and stuff. If you guys just watch your emails and watch the classroom, that information will, will be coming to you shortly.